and I've got yeah. um, three questions if I remember them. Sure. Um, you showed um, different gene mutations, you kind of categorised those into different mechanisms, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if they kind of then all, so if the disease process looks the same with the different genes or not, so that's the first question. Mm -hmm. The second question is, do people with who do have the gene mutations typically have one or more than one? That's and it. Yep. The third question is how, what can you talk about how the, res the genetic research is relevant for people with sporadic MND? Sure. So I'll start with the last question. So uh, that question was, what do the genetics mean for people with sporadic MND, which is a fantastic question. And what we've learnt from other fields, and, and I will say that we do look at fields like Alzheimer's disease and cancer and things like that to kind of, uh, I think that MND research is, is, a, is this, you know, a smaller cousin of some of these fields. Uh, we are not as far ahead as some of those other fields. So within Alzheimer's disease fields, there are genetic forms, um, but the pathology is the, is the same whether it's sporadic and or not. And so you really can learn about how the disease works. And we, there are fundamental differences, but essentially the, the same result. And we, we do think the same with MND. So as an example, the proteins that accumulate in sporadic MND, so the main protein is called TDP43, and there are mutations in TDP43 in, from, in some familial forms. Uh, and, and even in, in the C9-ORF72 families, they do get TDP43 pathology. So we really do think that, that chasing down why that's happening will be beneficial across all of those. Now, in saying that, there are other uh, aspects so such as, so there's a, a gene called ubiquitin 2. Uh, it, it feeds into the, what, the protein degradation or removal story that I told you about. It also has TDP43 pathology. So we think there are a few different ways of getting to that endpoint. Um, so we do think that there is merit in looking at the genetic forms to understand what's happening in sporadic. I, I think that um, there will be some genetic contribution even to sporadic and, and maybe um, these large screens that we're doing, uh, that Matthew and Ian are contributing to, will understand um, not rare mutations that, that cause a disease, but maybe common changes that will, con that will combine with many common changes to give a disease. And that's what I hope that we'll be able to get to a point, and, that, and, and at that point we'll be able to screen people much, much earlier. Okay, so that, that was your last question. Um, now you may have to remind me of your... Okay. Um, with different genes actually having okay. different processes, yeah. are they kind of all linked together? I mean, do they all look the same in the end? Or yeah. do they look different? yeah, so I think I partially answered that question. So I think there are two exceptions. So the SOD1 yeah. and um, another one called FUS. So they look slightly differently. The accumulation of proteins is the common thing, but the Diff, we, we see different proteins accumulating. So I still think that there is um, a relationship between those two forms, but there is something different about those two. And, and um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, with the, with the, oh, the, the, the data that we have at the moment about um, people with genetic changes, to what extent is, is there one mutation or to what extent are there multiple mutations? Yeah, so the question is, is, is it just one gene per family or can you have two different genes contributing? And the, the answer is, is that so far it only takes, in the, in the ones that we know of, that, that, uh, so the SOD1, TDP, it looks like it only takes one change to cause disease. Uh, there is increasing evidence that, um, that there can be more than more changes. So SOD1, I think, is, a, is it's very much a pure motor neuron disease. Uh, so that makes it different from the rest as well. Um, and it looks like it's a very, very dominant disease. The others, you may have to have other genetic hits to get the disease. So I guess that a message is that just because you have the genetic change does not necessarily mean that you will get 
and get the disease. Thank you, My dad has sporadic. Yeah. Mm. Um, is there anything that I can do to assist in helping? Can I have any tests done? Or is so, it just too hard? <laughs> no, no. Um, so. We are at Macquarie in, in collaborate. So we, we collaborate with the guys at Macquarie University and they have, um, they are uh, building a biobank. Um, and so they're collecting um, blood and hair and um, skin cells uh, from people with MND and members of their family so that we have uh, healthy cells and MND cells. So that's, if, if you're interested, then that's a potential way to contribute. Uh, Macquarie, oh Wollongong, um, so, so we would love to, yeah, um, no, so the, yeah, the biobank is really at, at Macquarie, so we, um, yeah, we're unable to collect at Wollongong, uh, but you're welcome to come to the university and, and um, we can show you around the labs if you like. So how, how do I get in touch with them? Uh, you can get in, truck, in touch direct with me, so um, if you have my name, I think if you Google me, you'll find my, uh, all my details on the web. Okay. There's a, a lot of uh, good data mining software and things going around the world at the moment, including what uh, the organisations in America for crime detection and anti-terrorism are using. How are we going with using good uh, systems analysis software in research? It's a really, really important question. Uh, it's. Sorry, it was a really important question. I'm going to repeat the question now. Um, <laughs> we're talking about uh, software to kind of data mine and it's a, the, the amount of data that we're talking about. And it's specifically, we're, we're, there is a lot of data coming out of these genetic screens and if you think the millions and millions of bases and uh, it's, it's mind boggling. Um, and so I think the better we are at the software analysis, the more that we will be able to understand and, and, and pull out of that. Uh, I, think, I think that we're still developing the tools to really understand it. And there is a shortage actually in specialists in that bioinformatics. Uh, so it's a, it's a really important aspect of the analysis and something that, that I think that we're not perfecting just yet. It's a, yeah, okay, so the question is about the, what we'll call the anti-gene therapeutics. And so I guess the SOD1, because that was the first mutation discovered, it's really kind of the one that it, I think will, it will, the therapeutic will happen first. And I think that we're probably another, I, I was talking to some, some people um, working in the background on that, and so this is not my project, but um, that, they hope to be in um, back into clinical trials in 12 months. They're trying to work out dosage and these types of things. Um, the trick, the real trick, is actually getting it to motor, you know, these important molecules actually to the motor neurons. It's really tricky, uh, and so this is something that they're working on. They have been doing a lot of preclinical kind of background work, but once um, once that opens up, I think it will open up. Maybe the SOD1 molecule w might not work for everyone, but what that will do is allow, um, it will open up the door to the other, knocking down other genes. So um, this is really just the, a stepping stone to getting a much wider, um, I guess, avenue for, for a lot of different inherited forms. And for TDP, uh, the trick with, the, we know that too much SOD1 is bad for the cell, but we're not quite sure about TDP 
we, it could be dangerous to attempt to knock that down because that could actually be contributing to the disease. So this is something that, um, that the researchers are really, really kind of considering. And SOD1 is an obvious one to start with. C9 ORF is the next one, and it will be not far behind. But what the SOD1 means for the sporadic, yeah, we don't know yet, but, um, but certainly it will open the avenues for, for other treatments. Um, with the research for the skin biopsy and the um, family members, the sporadic, mm. if you're connected to a different clinic, mm. is there a crossover? We go to um, Matthew Keenan's in Sydney, and I was just wondering if there's a crossover, yep. if you can do anything through him, through I his clinic. Yeah, I, Sorry, research program. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I think that at least in the early stages, um, the, the, all of the samples from the biobank were coming through um, Professor Dom Rowe's clinic. And I'm not sure about the crossover, but I'm sure Matthew will know about it. And so um, he's, yeah, he's the best one to ask. Another one over here. If you can use pluripotent cells, can you also use us with our, our own diseased mother neurons and uh, get some biopsies and things? Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's, the, that's the idea. I, I mean, and I think that there's, there's another talk this afternoon about stem cells. Um, and their potential use for therapy and you know, fixing mutations and things like this. But certainly in the lab for us, understanding the difference, you know, growing side by side uh, stem cells or, and growing them as neurons uh, next to cells that don't have MND, so from people with MND and those without, is, is going to tell us a lot about the physiology and the metabolism of, of motor, people with motor neuron disease and what, what is it that's different. So, so it's good as getting a real life bit of my muscle? Or? <laughs> well, it's, it's the difference, the main difference is that it's not in, in its context, so uh, it's not connected to muscle, it's not surrounded by myelin sheaths and all of these other complicated things. So it, we're, we're, it will tell us some important information, but it won't, it, that you're right, it won't tell us everything. Um, but we are also able to grow muscle cells from people with MND and then kind of try and connect our neurons to the, the muscles and really kind of um, um, look at more than a one-dimensional system. So it is possible. Another question over you. It's uh, probably a silly question, but all the information that's being gathered at the moment throughout Australia, mm. is that all being shared or is everybody keeping their own information and just sharing the general, the general stuff? Yeah. So the, the question is, uh, is information shared between researchers? And this is a, this is a really important question uh, because the more sharing that we do, the faster things move. Uh, we don't, if we share information, then we're not duplicating and wasting resources. Um, and sadly, that's not always the case. And this is, this is um, I guess, on a researcher to researcher individual basis. Um, and the, I guess the saddest part of that story is that in order for a researcher, like myself, I'm paid by the government um, and I have to apply for funding to, to keep my job. Um, in order for that to happen, people have to publish papers, not cure disease. That's the, that's the outcomes that the government wants you to have. And so some researchers will hold their data to themselves until they can publish in a really prestigious journal rather than share immediately what they have found. Um, and so I think the system is broken um, in terms of totally openly sharing everything that we have. Um, but some of us, um, definitely, uh, we collaborate a lot in the MND field is not too big in Australia that we don't. Um, I'm often talking to people that are working on MND, go to Melbourne, come here to Macquarie, 
um, and we work together a lot. So it, it's definitely happening, but not, it doesn't happen all of the time.